Chapter 5. There is nothing like a family dunking to make everyone feel at home. It turned out that Arthur Scott was looking for land right in the same county, and the Hamiltons invited him to make their cabin his headquarters for as long as he was around. Sometimes he would be gone two or three days to the western part of the county. At those times, Anne noticed that she wasn't the only one who stopped on the doorstep to glance toward the road, and she wasn't the only one who listened for her boots. Everyone felt better when Arthur Scott was there. One morning, before Mr. Scott left on his business, he went to the edge of the clearing to chop firewood for Mrs. Hamilton. Anne went along. She took her knitting and sat down on a stump near Mr. Scott. Anne had a lot of questions to ask, but there was one that was especially important. She finished her row of stitches, put down her needles, and waited for Arthur Scott to straighten up between blows of his axe. Mr. Scott, she said, why did you ever want to come on this side of the mountain to settle? Arthur Scott sank his axe to a log and left it there. When he lifted his head, Anne recognized the same look of excitement that Daniel had had and David and his father and Uncle John when they had first talked in the West. Land, Arthur Scott replied, replied briefly. More land than I could ever afford in the East, and a stake in the new part of the country. Anne picked up her knitting again. Land. It was the same disappointing answer that the Hamilton men gave. Why would anyone give up a working farm and good neighbors and a school and a church for a lot of uncleared land? Someday you will understand, Arthur Scott said. Someday this hill will mean so much to you that you wouldn't leave it even if you had the chance. Anne was about to say what she thought of Mr. Scott's someday, when there was a sudden muffled snort behind her. Turning around, she saw Andy McPhail hiding behind a tree. He had been listening to every word, and he was laughing at what Arthur Scott had said. Come on out, Andy, I see you, Anne called sharply, but already Andy was bounding away and heading for cover. Why, that's the same boy that's been spying on me ever since I've been here, Arthur Scott exclaimed in surprise. Every time I ride down the hill, I see him peeping out from behind a bush or staring down from a tree. He's strange, Anne exclaimed. She realized now that Andy hadn't come around at all since Arthur Scott had been there. At least he hadn't come in sight. Later, when Anne walked back to the cabin with Mr. Scott, she looked over her shoulder and saw Andy again. He was following them in the distance, darting from tree to tree. After that, whenever Arthur Scott was around, Anne was aware of a mysterious sound. A branch cracking, creaking, a padded footstep, a stone roll. Then one day, Arthur Scott said he wouldn't be back for several weeks. He had found land on the other side of Catfish Camp, so far west that the Indians still came there. He needed to take care of the deed, and he wanted to do a little clearing before he went back east. After the winter, he planned to bring his father back and settle. That evening, when Mr. Scott had left for his new land, Annie McPhail came out of hiding. He walked right up to the Hamilton's open door while they were eating supper and left. Come in, Andy, Mr. Hamilton invited. I brought you something. Andy stepped in and held out an enormous piece of venison. My pa's back. He killed two deer. He says to give this to you and thank you kindly for helping us out while he was gone. Andy rushed from one sentence to another as if he wanted to get it over. We are moving on soon, he said, taking a big breath. Going back to where we came from after a few weeks when Ma gets a little stronger. Andy started to leave. Mr. Hamilton glanced over at his wife who nodded as if she were agreeing to something. Come back a minute, Andy, Mr. Hamilton called. I had a proposition for you and your father. Ask him if he would like to give us a hand with our work on the hill, as long as he's around. We're going to finish clearing and plow the south field for a fall planting of rye. In return, you folks can help yourself to all the vegetables you can eat and fresh milk every day. You're big enough to help out too, Andy. We will figure out some special payment for you if you've a mind to. Andy's eyes were alight. I've a mind to, he answered quickly, and I know a payment. 
Suddenly his face flushed bright red as if he had heard himself say something he hadn't known he was going to say. He turned and ran out of the cabin. As he went, Ann saw sticking out of his back pocket a bunch of old heat pods. She followed Andy out of the door and stopped him in front of the cabin. What kind of payment were you thinking of? Nothing, he grunted, turning away from her. The heat pods looked crumpled. Ann noticed, as if he had, they had been handled all. You know, she said, I'd give you writing lessons any time you wanted. You wouldn't need to pay for that. Andy studied his bare toes, and when he spoke, Ann could hardly hear him. What I was thinking, he said, is I'd like to work for your pa in return for writing lessons. Well, let's begin right now, Ann said cheerfully. I Only I have one question to ask you first, Andy McPhail. Why did you hide and spy on Arthur Scott while he was here? Andy didn't look up. Didn't like him, he said. I wanted him to go. He couldn't for ask for lessons as long as he was here. Besides, he wouldn't want to talk to me when there was an educated man around. Andy looked at Anne with some of his old defiance. Now would you, Miss Gettysburg? Anne sighed in exasperation and picked up a stick. Marking in the bare dirt next to the cabin, she wrote the letters of the alphabet. Here's your first lesson, she said. After that, every day, when Andy and Mr. McPhail came up the hill to work for Mr. Hamilton, Andy would stop off for a lesson. In the evening, he would stop again. Before long, he was putting letters together to make words, and then he took to experimenting on his own with words. As he went past the cabin, he would scratch a word in the dirt, leaving it there for Anne to find and correct the spelling. One day, Anne found that beside the door the whole sentence Gettysburg is elegant. Anne smiled and pick up, picked up a stick to make corrections. She wrote, Gettysburg is very elegant. All the time that Andy was learning, he seemed to be changing in other ways too. Anne noticed that he seemed to walk straighter. He didn't hang his head so much and he wasn't forever looking for a fight. The summer days drifted away. The blackberries ripened beside the road and the corn in Mr. Hamilton's field reached up to Daniel's shoulders. Then one day, Arthur Scott came back. It was evening. Anne and Andy were sitting on the steps, Anne, and Anne was reciting the rule about I before E except after C, when there was the sound of hoofbeats, and Arthur Scott was riding up to the cabin. Anne dropped the stick she was using and ran to meet him. As Mr. Scott swung down from the saddle, he found himself surrounded by Hamiltons, who had heard him and come in from all directions. David came out of the barn and held up his, out his hand. Welcome, neighbor, he grinned. You must be a full-fledged landover now. That makes you a neighbor even if you are on the other side of the county. Guess we'll have to get up early in the morning when we take Sunday dinner with you. Everyone was laughing and talking. And it was a few minutes before Anne noticed that Andy McPhail had disappeared. She shrugged her shoulders. If he was going to be so silly, she wasn't going to waste time thinking about it. There was such little time to be with Arthur Scott anyway. He was leaving the next morning. All the Hamiltons seemed to be aware of the short time left with their good friend and of the long, lonely winter ahead. That evening, there was more gaiety on the hill than there had ever been. The laughter and jokes and stories stretched out long after candle lighting, long after they would normally be in bed. The next morning, Arthur Scott was gone. Just before he left, he leaned down from his horse and whispered to Anne, Don't let that fire go out, he said, before I come back next spring. Then he urged his horse forward, and in a moment, all that could be seen of Arthur Scott was a shadow of dust on the long, long road east. That day was an empty day and a long one at Hamilton Hill. The sun seemed unusually warm, and the chores seemed especially tiresome. Anne had the sensation the isle, the hill was an island, floating farther and farther away from the rest of the world. Even the road had no magic to it that day. Anne didn't bother to go to the road in the evening when she took down her diary. She sat on the doorstep, thinking that Andy might come along for, the, for a lesson. While she waited, she...
thought about Arthur Scott and tried to remember everything that had happened since she met him on the road. She thought of that first dinner and his stories about Valley Forge. She picked up her pencil and wrote in her diary. We must seem very ordinary to Arthur Scott, who has seen General Washington and been with such brave folks. But if I had, had, if I had the same chance as Rachel Peck, I would be brave too. I would not mind snow either if I was doing something important. Instead, look where I am and what I'm doing. On a forsaken hill in the western country, tending a vegetable patch. Suddenly, Anne felt as if someone were in the doorway close behind her, looking over her shoulder. She snapped her diary shut. David was standing at her back, gazing innocently over her head at the summer sky. I declare it looks like snow, he drawled. I believe you'd better bake a batch of gingerbread, Sister Anne. Anne whirled around. You've been reading what I wrote, she choked. You, you snoop. Anne dropped her diary on the step and started to run toward the road. It was then that she noticed the letter scratched by the cabin. Good riddance. Anne had, of course, Andy had, of course, been thinking of Arthur Scott. Anne scuffed up the letters angrily before she went on. She didn't see two eyes peering out of a bush near the cabin. All she wanted to be alone, where she could feel sad or she could feel mad without interference.